Hi there and welcome to I'll Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Mowry of Drea Renee Knits and here's where I try to answer some of your questions. Um, I'm just going to start off real briefly and quickly. I announced this week that I am going on a medical leave um, for the next three months following my doctor's advice. I talked a little bit about it in my newsletter so if you get my newsletter then you may have read about it or it may be waiting for you in your inbox and i also did a very brief post about it on instagram um but i really really enjoy doing these little weekly videos every week so i am going to continue these because they fill me up and they're a highlight and I think that it will be good for me to continue this part during my leave. So I will still be here every Friday morning to connect with y'all because it's just been a really amazing addition to my life in the past almost two years. I can't believe it's almost been two years. Um, and I hope that it's a joyful and positive part of your week as well. So today I am wearing the Gibbs sweater, which I have realized I have not been utilizing enough this fall and early winter. It is very cold here today. Uh, we did get a little bit of snow, like not even, like a dusting. And my whole family was joking because my husband and I like to send my siblings and parents photos of like, we finally got snow. Um, and my my big brother sent a picture of somebody measuring, like trying to measure how much snow when there's literally like a dusting. Anyway, so it's funny, but I have my fingers crossed for more. And this sweater is just feeling very, very cozy because it gets pretty cold up here in my studio. Um, so yeah, this is Gib. It is an all over texture that I've used in some of my other patterns. This is the same stitch pattern that I used in my Oxbow cardigan. Um, this is knit up in Brooklyn Tweeds in Bew, and actually the Oxbow cardigan is knit up in Brooklyn Tweeds Cory. And I also used it in my Horfrost shawl and a few others. I love this texture. It is a knit pearl texture that is so easy to get in the rhythm with. Do y'all see this? I just realized I really have got to get better trimming the tails because I have these cuffs folded up unfortunately I don't have any scissors right now. Um, but anyways it's a little knit pearl texture it's really easy to memorize and it's just fun and I love how it looks and it actually looks different on the other side oh I just used it in the big cozy cardi too except for I have the other side as the right side for that sweater um so both sides are beautiful and different and then it has a cute little cable raglets and this I also did size um, for both men and women as far as grading goes. Obviously, they do not need to be gender specific, but as far as trying to fit both broad shoulders and narrower shoulders and different heights and all that kind of stuff. So anyways, I will, of course, link to it below. And <coughs> excuse me, I think that's it to kick things off. I'm pretty sure I thought I showed you all this in the last episode, but I was traveling and, you know, my memory, <laughs> I was really wearing it, but I don't remember if I actually like really showed it. So this is my hand spun Harlow that I cast on as my travel project for Rhinebeck because I didn't have uh easy travel project going so i was like okay i'm just gonna cast on a hat so i spun this yarn it is from nest fiber and i love the unique colorway she put together here it's like lavender and then this almost poppy red orange and a little bit of mint it's just kind of unexpected colors to go together and i really like them and i probably did fractal <laughs> I don't remember that well, but it was when I was playing around with spinning a little thicker. So I decided to cast out as a one color Harlow hat and I extended the length of the hat by like three inches because I knew I wanted a warmer cuff around my ears for like my long walks. So here it is. I really like it. I hope you do too. <laughs> okay, let's get into some questions. 
question number one is a spinning question. I don't usually ever start with the spinning questions, but I'm going to today. So, I'm interested in learning to spin. My mom brought my mom bought me a drop spindle for my birthday that I've yet to use. <laughs> Um, I fell down the YouTube rabbit hole and now I'm searching for a spinning wheel. Help! What is your suggestion on the best wheel for beginners? So I do have a couple wheels and I personally started on the Shacked Matchless wheel, which I love. Um, I think that it does pretty much everything that you'd want to do and it's a very nice wheel. Um, it comes with a lot of different size whirls and it's just great. I really, really like it. It's beautiful. It is fairly pricey. Um, since then, I was introduced to another wheel and this is actually, I was actually thinking about this yesterday. I'm like, you know, I think that this is the wheel I would recommend to a newer spinner, like somebody buying their first wheel. So this is the Lendrum Double Treadle, and I have shown this before on here, I believe, but the reason I would recommend this as a first wheel is it's so easy to take apart and adjust, and it's just not, it's not a finicky wheel. It's a really, really simple wheel. So the top just pops off. It's so easy and fast to change a bobbin. I also find generally it's really nice to be able to get your wheel, your um, drive wheel, is that the word I want? Um, turning just by treadling. But some wheels, it can be hard for that to do, um, especially if they're heavier, things like that. I love that this wheel, I can just treadle and get my wheel spinning the way I need it to really easily. Um, as I said, changing bobbins is super easy. I also think the care and maintenance of it is really easy. There's not a ton of places you need to oil it. It actually has ball bearings in the center of it, which you don't oil, you just leave that alone. Um, and then it also has a poly band, this stretchy band as the drive band. And I like that, again, just because it's kind of low maintenance. Um, so yeah, the Lendrum Double Treadle is probably what I would recommend to like a friend when they started um, spinning. It's also, as far as wheels go, not a horrible price point. And I think that you could find one used too um, for even a less expensive option. In general, I think that you can find used wheels for sure um, when you're starting, but yeah. So I have nothing but good things to say about our Shacked Matchless wheel. I love it, um, but I do think that this Lendrum is a great, great starter wheel. So there you go. That would be my recommendation. All right. I'm finally getting around to trying your DRK Everyday Socks, and I'm using a self-striping self sock advent to make them, and I want your advice about heel placement. I often overthink heel placement. Um on a regular top down sock anyway, because it seems like inevitably my sock is a little loose once my sweaty foot stretches it out. Now I'm even overthinking it more because I would love the stripes to work out so I can use the contrast color on the wheel, on the heel. Any advice on how to deal with the heel placement with a self striping yarn, like your whiskey in a teacup sample. Also, if I'm trying on my sock and trying to figure out the heel placement, where should I start the increases? You say about one and a half inches for my size sock, but is there a good place on the foot where increases should begin so I don't end up with a loose sock? So yes, I have tips for all of these. I actually happen to have my very first pair of DRK Everyday and Whiskey and Teacup. You will see these are quite faded. I have worn these so many times. <laughs> that, I mean, it's like, I have just worn the life out of these socks. And now I'm getting ready to darn them because they don't have a hole yet, but they are about to have a hole. Can you see here? You see my like finger through it. Ooh, it's getting thin. So I think I'm just gonna duplicate stitch over that area since there's no hole yet. <coughs> Excuse me, that's what I'm gonna try. I would love, by the way, this is this is what I'm planning to do in the early part of my leave is I have a pile of socks 
that I'm going to mend because I am not great about prioritizing that. And so it's just like this growing pile. And finally, I'm like, oh my gosh, I barely have any socks to wear because I know that is just one sock. We talked about this in the last episode, but I'm like, okay, it is time. I thought that would be a nice relaxing kind of fun thing to do. So if anybody has any mending tips, I would love to hear. I do have a darning mushroom and I even have one of those cool old tiny looms that you can use for mending. So I thought I would try different methods on some of my different socks and see what works the best for me. But that is not the answer to this question because you didn't ask about mending socks. So let me return to the question. Number one, if you notice that in general, with your hand knit socks, they always end up feeling too long in the foot. Don't knit them so long. So if you have a sock you can refer to, um, go measure how long that is and make sure you knit less for the next one. Um, but in general, it's a good rule of thumb that you want, I think it's 10% negative ease in a sock in the length like think about like socks stretch so I really do I don't like like when I put on my shoe if all of a sudden my heel ends up by my ankle as I get my shoe on and that means the foot's a little bit too long um so some of it you can fine tune through trial and error some it, it it's challenging because I will give you a tip on when to start your heel shaping but different yarns are gonna act differently. Some are gonna grow more, some are gonna grow less. So over time, it is kind of trying things out and you might land on, like I know I have some kind of go-to sock yarns that I know how they're gonna act. Like I love Gage Dye Works sock yarn. I find that it doesn't stretch too much. These have lasted so long with how much I wear them. Um, so I think kind of figuring out, sometimes you end up with like a go-to that you know and can trust. And then if you fine tune that foot length to be perfect for you, you just write that in the notes app in your phone or in your knitting notebook or somewhere where you can refer to it and be like, okay, I know this is what works for me. But generally speaking, when knitting a flegal heel, I am going to attempt to get my leg up here, which I wasn't really thinking about. Of course, this is like the one day I wore jeans. I'm not somebody who wears jeans very often. I like soft pants. <laughs> but today, of course, I wore jeans and now I'm trying to put my leg up. Um, so, <laughs> this is the weirdest thing I think I've done. But, okay, look at my beautiful curio socks. Um, so, when your sock reaches, dang, I wish I had, I wish I had, when on the needle, I could show you. That would be even better. I actually do have socks on the needles, but I'm like almost finished them to the cuff. Um, but anyways, so once, I'm trying to like not have my foot be at a weird angle for you, but once your sock reaches this bend in your foot, right where your foot, top of your foot meets your ankle, that is where you need to be starting your flegal heel. When you are doing the toe up, um, socks with a flegal heel like my DRK everyday socks. So that is when I am starting a pattern and before, because I like to take the gauge from the finished sock, that's what ends up in the pattern itself. So as I'm kind of figuring out a new pattern and playing around with things, that is where I want to knit to before I start my shaping. Um, so that's a really good rule of thumb besides just the measurement in the pattern. The pattern, the measurement in the pattern is a good guide, um, especially for newer sock knitters and especially if you're knitting them for a gift and you kind of have to estimate how it's going to fit that person. Um, but yeah, so basically just right where the top of your foot meets your ankle, that's where you want it to hit and you don't want it crawling up your ankle or it's gonna be a little too long. So for you, I would really pay attention and not letting it like air on the side of just getting there. And I'll kind of pull on the sock just as though I'm putting it on. So I do, I even give it a little bit of tension. I'm not like yanking it up to the top of my foot, but I'm also not letting it be like super loose, if that makes sense. Um, and again, once you figure out how many rows really works for you to get the right length, write that down and then you don't have to worry about it again. I seriously have a note in my phone 
for different like weights of socks or depending on what kind of heel I'm doing and stuff like that. So I know how many rows I need to knit and I love that I never have to worry about it again. I'm just like, oh, I know I need to knit 60 rows now from my toe to where I'm gonna start my heel shaping. So as far as the stripes go, I find that it's actually really, really easy. Um, so this is, for an advent calendar, I was curious about that because I'm like, well, are you using mini skeins that you're striping or is it actually like a dyed self-striping yarn? Because a self-striping yarn, you don't really have control over how wide those stripes are. They, they are what they are. Um, but you just start it on the same color for both socks. So I started with the darker blue here and I knew Gage Dye Works is so great at their striping and their math that they put into their yarn. I knew that these were gonna end at the same place for me to start my heel shaping. So they do match perfectly. Um, the other thing about Gage is that they, the heel, they include, they dye part of the yarn for the heel and toe to make it a contrast. So when you're winding your yarn, you actually can like, I just break that color off and wind my own little ball for heel and toe. So that shouldn't matter, you know, how do I say that? <laughs> um, yeah, so the stripes should work out. If you are not, if it's not actually self-striping where the yarn is doing the striping for you, because again, you can't control that. But if it is dyed well, it should just line up for you. And those, come on, I'm really holding up my um, abused socks so close to the camera there. So I also knit these socks. These are another pair of DRK every day. And I striped them using Spin Cycle in two different colors and i think i just did five rows one two three four yeah i did five rows so again it made it really easy to count my foot and know when i needed to do the heel because i could just count my sections really quickly and make sure that they lined up um but yeah i hope i answered your question there uh basically i guess i'm just saying it should all work out <laughs> And you'll be fine. Um, but yeah, okay, next question. I have about a million of these bats all around right now because I don't know where else to store them while I'm spinning for the weekender. And <laughs> everything's sticking to like my pile of fluff right here. Okay, all right. This is a bonus question of sorts. I'm getting married next year, and I'm curious if you incorporated any knitting into your wedding to Spicy Pete. What are some of your favorite memories from your special day? Uh, I just thought this was such a sweet question. So we got married in the height of summer. We got married on August 25th, and so there was not any knitting there. Uh, there was embroidery though. So because it was summer, I did a lot of embroidery, which I actually have some of it hanging up in my studio, uh, but none none in close quarters. It's all, it's all over there. But I did like a welcome in embroidery. I did all kinds of stuff. And we got married on Peter's parents' farm. And so we hung up the embroidery in the trees and we actually did a ton of crafts. There was a lot of handmade at our wedding. So we dyed big coffee filters, like the kind that a coffee shop would use or like a anywhere that's making like the giant things of coffee. So we dyed those all different colors. We made these big flowers out of them. I, Peter's dad cut us wood from like trees that had fallen down on the farm and stuff. And I put photos onto those and we hung those around. I mean, we painted squash. We did all kinds of stuff. Um, so it was very sweet and it was very magical. We, Peter's parents also planted a million wildflower seeds on their farm so we got married in the meadow meadow married in the meadow and from there um we all walked the us and the wedding party and our guests all walked from the meadow through the woods out into the orchard which is where we had our um wow i just lost that word what's the word reception yeah that's it 
so it was wonderful. It was very magical. Um, it's one of the best days of my life, and I hope yours is too. I wanted to show you because, although I did not have anything at my wedding, um, I have been tagged in quite a few weddings where people did have something knit and it is always the biggest honor to have one of your patterns in somebody's wedding. So my most frequent wedding shawl for my patterns that I see is birds of a feather. So this is birds of a feather and I have been tagged in quite a few photos of people using this as their wedding shawl. So I thought that was really special. I've also seen some people having winter weddings and they'll knit a wedding sweater. I mean, there's people who knit their wedding dress, which is just like amazing. Um, so I do think that if you have the time, I would say don't, I got a little <laughs> excited with the amount of crafts I wanted to include in our wedding. Um, I also was a baker at the time. And so I baked not only our wedding cake, but then I decided we should have cupcakes just in case people wanted a different flavor. And then I also thought we should have pie pops. So I made all of these miniature blueberry, Michigan blueberry pies on like popsicle sticks. Oh my goodness. There was a lot of sweets and not enough people to eat them all. I also baked as our wedding gift. I baked um, the Upper and Lower Peninsula as cookies of Michigan, and those were like our wedding gift for everybody. Um, so yeah, but don't stress yourself out trying to do too much for your wedding. Enjoy the day. But it was very, very special and very fun. So congratulations to you, and I hope your wedding day is everything you would love it to be. All right. <clears throat> I started knitting a year ago and I love your weekly Q&A which has helped so much on my knitting journey. Yay, welcome to the club. Now I have a question of my own. So I knit a lot of onesies for my daughter and usually make the buttonhole by doing a yarn over. All is fine in the beginning, but after she's worn it for some time, the buttonhole grows, which leads to the buttons opening when she's wearing it. Is there a way to fix this? I tried reinforcing the buttonhole with some yarn, but the same thing has happened. Should I use a different method for making buttonholes? Reinforce it even more? Use bigger buttons? Uh, but then they don't fit before the hole grows. So definitely some troubleshooting here. What I would do on, if you still have onesies that still fit her, but you feel like it's hard to put for her to wear them because they're popping open. Those are the ones that I would maybe swap out the buttons for bigger buttons because it would just be the quickest fix. And then you could use those smaller buttons on a new onesie. For the new onesies, I would consider doing a one row buttonhole because that's a pretty strong buttonhole. I think definitely stronger than a yarn over buttonhole. Um, but another suggestion I thought I would throw out there to try is to use snaps instead of buttons. Like, I feel like sometimes it's nice to be able, uh, when you, especially when you're changing diapers all the time, it's nice to just be able to do the snaps instead of messing around with the buttonhole. The only thing you'd wanna take care with is I would probably reinforce the edge of the onesie on both sides with a ribbon, and then I would hammer on the snaps. And I think that that ribbon would keep the knitting from getting too, um beaten up from pulling on the snaps and i would just kind of be careful as you open those snaps but i think if you hold on the ribbon to undo them then that could work really well so either so bigger button on the older onesies one row buttonhole for new onesies or a ribbon and try out some snaps um and I'd be curious to know how you're reinforcing the buttonholes. I wonder if you did a whip stitch all the way around, if that might um, reinforce it well, or even mattress, not mattress. Oh geez, what is that stitch? I think it's just, maybe it's called blanket stitch, where you, you'll see it going around the edge of blankets. That could be something to try too. Um, but best of luck, and that's really sweet. I knit my kids basically just hats and stuff when they were little, but they are both due for new sweaters, and um, my son needs a cowl, and they could both use some cozy socks. They love cozy socks, so I think that's actually what I'm going to do over the next couple months is kind of fill up with some knits for my kiddos because they don't, they need some. <laughs> okay. Uh, bup, bup. 
here's my question. Recently, I've knit a couple sweaters with a folded collar. Both sweaters have had you do, yep, a provisional cast on. Knit the collar and then fold it and knit two ends of the collar together before continuing onto the body. For both sweaters, I found that the result is a collar that doesn't really hold its shape. It stretches out for, oops, it stretches out in a way that I don't really like. Do you have any idea why this might be? Am I doing something wrong or is this a common problem? Do you have any suggestions for fixing the problem? I've read about doing a single crochet reinforcement on the inside of the collar, but this seems like it wouldn't work well for a folded collar since I'd only get the inside layer. I appreciate any advice you have. I love the sweaters and I want to be able to save the collars. Okay, um, so great question and yes. So the reason that happens is because when you do a provisional cast on and then do a folded collar, there's no stability there. What works better if you don't want that collar to stretch out is actually to just knit the sweater and then come back, pick up stitches into that cast on edge, knit your collar, fold it over, sew it down. So that cast on edge that you're picking up into will be a lot stronger and stable so that everything doesn't just stretch out over time because it is the weight of your sweater hangs on that collar. Um, so that is why it can do that over time. So in the future, I that would be my recommendation is when you are knitting a sweater like this, go ahead and skip the collar and just cast on the number of stitches and go right into the directions for the yoke and then come back, pick up stitches for the collar, knit it, fold it, whip stitch it. To fix the ones you've already made, you have a couple options. I do think that that crochet reinforcement would be a great option. I know it feels like you're only going through one layer, but you'd really be going through where you, um, you fold it and you knit the two ends together. So you really would be getting both. And that line is going to help even if it only went through one layer, that line is going to help just create stability without a ton of stretch right there. So I do think that that would be worth trying. The other thing that really can help is by putting in some elastic into that collar, which is gonna help close it back up. If you actually search for that on YouTube, there are tutorials on how to do that, but you basically are just gonna run some elastic through that collar and it's gonna help cinch it. Um, so. They are savable. All right. Oh, I have been meaning to mention this ever since a few weeks ago when I told y'all that I was trying out a new gluten-free pie crust. I think I forgot to ever say it, but it's been a crazy couple of weeks. So if I've said this, I apologize. Uh, but I've had a note here telling me pie crust so that I could tell y'all it worked. It worked beautifully. So I'm so excited to have a go-to pie crust. Now I'm like, oh, what else can I make? Maybe we should make a quiche. Maybe we should make a pot pie. Um, but it worked really, really beautifully. So that recipe was from the Loopy Whisk. And that's her Instagram handle and her blog. She has a great cookbook called... <laughs> baking perfected that's not it baked to perfection that's it baked to perfection um so I really really enjoy her recipes she has a pumpkin swiss roll cake that we also made and it is like my new favorite cake it was so delicious and it turned out so well um it was lovely gluten-free and I would recommend that recipe as well. Uh, but anyways, I will link the pie crust recipe below because I had a bunch of you asking about it. Like, did it work out? I haven't found a good gluten-free pie crust. And it really did. And it felt really similar to how I used to make pie crust as a baker using regular gluten flour. Um, so it was a winner. All right. Um, I think that is it for questions. We do have a couple knit alongs going on right now. Obviously the DRK spin it to knit it knit along is still going strong and will be through the spring. Here's my swatch I showed y'all last week. I'm very excited about it. It's got me spinning and spinning and spinning. Um, there's also the Insta Friends knit along annual 
I said that all jumbly. The Insta Friends annual knit along is also starting in like three days. I believe cast on is on the 17th. Don't hold me to that. But you can find out all that info online. Um, you can go to Shop La Mercerie Instagram. I'll put this stuff below too. Um, she's the one hosting it on Instagram. This is the sixth one and it's super fun and it uses my most recent pattern zig, which I just realized I should be wearing right now. <laughs> I always wear the pattern the week of the release and I was traveling the week of the release. And then I forgot today. I'll wear it next week. I'll try to remember that. Um, <laughs> darn. Anyways, and then also my friend Candace from the Farmer's Daughter Fibers is starting a big cozy cardi knit along. I've had a lot of emails asking, is there a knit along that's gonna happen? And there is. Candace announced it. You can find all the information on her blog over at thefarmersdaughterfibers.com. And um, I do know that Casson is January 1st. So they're going to kick it off right in the new year. And I think it's going to run for a couple months, two or three months. I think three. I think it goes into March. Um, so if you want to knit along, please join on any of those knit alongs. And yeah, I think that's it for today. I hope that you take good care of yourself this weekend. I hope you get some rest. That's what I'm planning to do. Maybe some pie baking or spinning or knitting or just relaxing, napping going for a walk, all those great, great things. And thank you so much for being here. Oh, is there still time? There is still time. So I also, um, since I will be on leave for a couple months, I am having a little sale on all of my independently published patterns. So you can save 25% on any of my patterns. The only ones that aren't included are ones that were published through a third party because I don't fully own the rights to them. So that's like Ronin and the Sink Cowl patterns like that. But all my other patterns are included and they're 25% off with the discount code Miss You. All capitals M I S S Y O U. And you can go to my Ravelry shop or my website, and that is going to expire this Sunday, which. What's the date? So that would be the 18th at midnight Eastern Standard Time. So if you had any of my patterns in your queue, on your wish list, now would be a good time to grab one. I hope you all have a great weekend, and I hope to see you back here next week. Bye.